Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Excellent. Greetings and welcome to New South Wales, uh, sorry, to I Interstate Parliament House. Um, this is an incredible array of pollies up here, more than we've ever had at Mardi Gras before. Let's hear it for them. Uh, noticeable by their absence are any members of any of the Conservative parties. Uh, Janelle Safin was here yesterday and opened the um, uh, opened uh, Mardi Gras, so at least there was some Labor input. But uh, what we've got here today is a fantastic representation of the importance of this issue in the political sphere in Australia at the moment. And I, for one, am incredibly excited to have this number of elected representatives here at Mardi Gras 2024. Let's hear it for them. It used to be, it used to be Anne Simons, Richard Jones, um, and Ian Cohen, who used to come out here regularly. And Sue was a gunja fairy and wasn't quite a politician yet although she still managed to boss people around. So, look, I'd like uh, to welcome you and welcome everybody here, and thanks. Look, this will be an impossible session uh, with all this number of fantastic, uh, uh, dedicated people uh, to the cause of drug law reform. Um, and, you know, uh, being an elected representative is not beer and Skittles, it's hard yakka, and I know all of the people here on stage, and they've all done incredibly hard, unpopular work uh, pushing the cause of drug law reform um, in the various parliaments. Unpopular with the other parliamentarians. Ah, oh, picky. In this room. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, you know, you get two politicians, you get three opinions, you get this number, you're going to get a shitload more. So, uh, could you please introduce yourselves, starting perhaps left, to, oh, right to left, right to left. Jeremy. Me, that's me. Yep. Jeremy. Oh, no, come on, come on. Oh, Jeremy Buckingham, legalised cannabis MP. Uh, I've been elected for the last year. So, yeah, back in, first legalised cannabis MP in the New South Wales Parliament. Hi, I'm Rachel Payne. I am Legalised Cannabis Victoria. Uh, David Edishenk and I got elected at the end of 2022, so we're about 16 months into our first term in Parliament. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Fiona Patton. I lost the election in 2022, um, but I did get elected in 2014, and I swear it was because there was a photo of me smoking a joint on a double page of The Age. <laughs> Nothing to do with being called the sex party at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Yeah, hi, I'm David Shoebridge, one of the Green Senators in the Federal Parliament. I'm the party's uh, justice spokes. Thanks. Brian Walker, uh, Legalised Cannabis in WA. Sophia Mohamed and myself were the first two elected members uh, for the Legalised Cannabis Party in Australia, in fact, worldwide. Here, here. I'm Sue. Oh, I don't have a... It's on. Oh, sorry. It is on. No, it's not. No, not anymore. Hang on, hang on. I got it. I got it. Okay. Uh, I am Sue Higginson. I am in the New South Wales Upper House. I have been there two years. I took the Senator's seat when he left, and I'm having the best time. <laughs> uh, I sit on the bench next to Sue uh, in the Upper House, Kate Fairman. Uh, the Greens Drug Law Reform and Harm Reduction Spokesperson in the New South Wales Parliament. And there's four of us uh, women MPs in the Upper House. Uh, I'm David Edishank, Legalised Cannabis Victoria for Western Melbourne. Uh, although I did have my identity somewhat challenged last week when an irate National Party politician during the debate in the House described me as Fiona Patton's predecessor, a uh, successor. So, <laughs> there we go. Same what a I. compliment. That's what I thought. Yeah, great. Thank you. So I thought the best thing, because 
quite frankly, we're all sick of coming to Nimbin every year. We just want change and we just want it to happen. I don't want to keep arguing this shit. It's been, for me, well over 30 years of coming to this hall and arguing this point over and over again. I've had enough of it. We want change. So I'm wondering if you can tell, we want change in two areas, legalised cannabis and drug driving law reform. Yes. And we certainly can't have one without the other or no one can use the shit, use it. So I would like some, a prediction from each of you as to when are we gonna see it? When will we see legalisation or at least decriminalisation of drugs throughout Australia? And when are we gonna see meaningful reform in drug driving? Uh, it's okay if you say never, but let's hear it. Let's hear the predictions, please. Oh, I'm running a book on this. Well, they'll be yeah. betting online, um, and we'll, we'll see, you know, in year, every year we'll, we'll have the tally and we'll work out who was right and who was wrong. Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, okay. Uh, my prediction for legalisation at a state level in New South Wales is probably 2028, uh, after the next... Because um, we, we're relying on the uh, Labor government to pass uh, the laws into being. So I don't think we're going to see it in this term. I think we could get them to shift their position to be uh, pro-legalisation and take that to the next state election and then hopefully get it done uh, very soon after that. That's my honest opinion. In terms of roadside drug testing, well, I hope we can get a result on that this year. I'd probably echo that with the, with the uh, drug driving uh, roadside testing is happening in Victoria. There is a trial happening, which they have the government of the day have committed to finishing by the end of this year. So we will be continuing to push them on that and make sure that they are bringing in legislation to enact driving laws by next year. When it comes to legalisation, I would think that regulation on a state level would probably look like the ACT plus model. Uh, I would hope that that would be before we hit the 100 year mark of prohibition, which is 2028. Yes. Uh, I agree, I think, and, and once one state goes with drug driving, and, and I think the first move obviously will just be for medicinal cannabis patients, we won't see it for um, the so-called illicit use of cannabis, but we will see it for patients, and I, I, I think we are less than 12 months away from one state moving, and the minute one state moves, the rest will follow. I think this, is, um, th this will happen. Uh, for the, the, the regulation of personal cannabis use, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel like we're, we're, within, we're, we're within five years now. We're seeing, we've certainly, I mean, the public opinion has changed um, completely. So we've, we've won that. We're, we're seeing the descheduling in the United States, which will also change the conversation. So I think these, these are all the things that will um, get us there, you know, yeah, within five. Yeah, so plan A is to legalise it across the country with a bill we've got for the Greens in the federal parliament later this year. I'll be honest, that's a tough plan, plan A. But there's 15 of us Greens in the federal parliament. Uh, we hold the balance of power in the Senate. Next year there'll be a federal election. If we get the balance of power in the lower house as well, we already have the legislation drafted, we have the plan, we have the commitment, I have plan B is to get this legalised, not in one state or territory, but for the whole bloody country after the next federal election as a key part of us using our balance of power in 2025. So 2025 for legalising recreational use. And once we do that, it's unstoppable to convert our drug driving laws from presence to impairment. I think it, it must follow. Because the only rational reason, if you can call it that, to keep the crap drug driving laws at the moment is cannabis is illegal. Once we legalise it nationally, those laws must fall. Well, we have a federal election coming up shortly and um, I'm fairly confident we're going to get some legalised cannabis candidates in the Senate as well. That, that'll be very much supportive of what's going on. And so I think we'd support uh, a rapid move to drug um, freedom, if you like, the legalising cannabis. If I'm looking at it in a, in a slow state, maybe five years, but I'm hoping quicker than that. But people generally reckon up to five years, maybe shorter. However, 
In Western Australia, we've now got a select committee report which was accepted by the government, and they've now made a working group to study, if you like, the THC driving laws, because they only ever produce a working group if they want to get a solution, and they know at the moment, they know absolutely that the current legislation is a lie. So we have a lie enshrined in law throughout Australia, and that's untenable, it's unacceptable. Now, I predict the Premier is going to introduce uh, the, the legislation for THC in driving uh, before the next election in March of next year. Uh, I anticipate that he's going to be asking for support from the crossbench, and I anticipate that we are going to be part of that. And then the condition for that, as we will hold the balance of power, if you don't pass this within six months, nothing passes the Upper House. So in November next year, latest. Um, no, oh, no, no. Sorry. I got it. I yeah. got it. It takes a minute to warm up. Um, I turn mine off so that I can reserve the power in the um, system, and then I turn it back on. Just, just making that point. Um, I think that it's so we don't hear her heckling. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, these guys have given some very realistic predictions, and I think they're probably very kind of on the money. But what I want to actually say about um, predictions is that we have some power, parliamentarians hold some power, but let's face it, the real power of the opportunity is with the people, it's with you guys. The power in the parliament is real, um, but to some extent it is absolutely illusory because they do in the parliament, we do, what the pressure from people presents. And I think at this point, we need to remain consistently open to the opportunity that the changes that we are all agitating for could happen any day. And I think that's the most important principle that we all operate on. Because as you know, from all of these people in on this stage, we have got various tools within the parliaments happening right now. David's got this incredibly ingenious plan at the federal level. We've got Kate, who's got bills in the New South Wales parliament. Jeremy has put bills in. We've got inquiries. All of these things, we've got a drug summit coming up. All of these things are presenting the disruption, the chaos, the opportunity, the mechanism and the vehicle. And we have to remain consistently and completely open to the opportunity that those changes could be implemented at any time because it's politics and right now we have governments and the only thing they are focused on is maintaining their power and winning the next election and if we as MPs are not absolutely cognizant every moment with our eyes peeled to the ground at that potential opportunity of making it happen tomorrow then we are failing. So we can predict, and that's important, but what's more important is that we are absolutely open to the opportunity that it could be any political moment. So here in New South Wales, uh, uh, hearing that, we have a drug summit apparently. Uh, Chris Minns, uh, Minns government says they're going to hold a drug summit. There's a hell of a lot of uh, lead in time. There's been a lot of promise. It's been talked about a lot. So something's got to happen uh, with that drug summit. He's got to do uh, something with that and has to do something surely in the area in terms of cannabis. I agree in terms of drug driving. Uh, reform. Uh, the other states will move like they do in everything from dying with dignity to abortion law reform and everything. New South Wales is uh, the most conservative, the most laggard and we have a, a Premier who is incredibly risk averse. However, there's a lot of pressure on him and I do think it's this low hanging fruit, the expense, the ridiculous numbers, the harassment. Uh, people are really sick of it. Uh, we'll be shining a light on it in the coming months and I really really do think that's the, the, the biggest reform we will get. I think drug checking could be in there as well. We'll still keep pushing for that. Uh, in terms of legalising, you know, we've got a bill in terms of taxing and regulating and establishing a, you know, a cannabis authority. I feel like in New South Wales, that's a while away. Yes, after the next election, there's no way the Minns government would bring anything like that uh, beforehand. And yeah, let's wait and see. Hopefully people will be able to 
maybe a bit of a decrim style, you know, what the ACT is doing a little bit uh, more. And, you know, let's, let's wait and see. What I can say is that Greens in the balance of power uh, with others, like legalised cannabis, we are there in the balance of power. We've given the government until the drug summit in terms of all these bills we have before uh, the parliament, after the drug summit, gloves are off. And yes, we, we, if we use our balance of power, if that's what it takes to get some of this reform through, then let's do it. Uh, the thing with predictions is they're always wrong, generally. Um, look, I, I think it's, it's really, it's obviously extremely difficult. In Victoria, we have a great advantage, which is um, the legacy that Fiona left in terms of having de denied the government the opportunity to say we need to set up another inquiry because she's already done it all and so that's that's given us a huge head start. I think in terms of legalisation we've prioritised strictly what we're just calling ACT plus so it's you know basic legalisation, grow your own, have a certain amount, half a dozen plants at home. Um, and then take out a few of the anomalies so you can, you can grow your plants in, in the ACT but it's still an offence to have a seed, which raises an interesting metaphysical question. Um, so our political cycle is such that we'll be back up for 26. Nothing brave will happen in 26, so on legalisation I'm going to predict that we will get legalisation, ACT plus in Victoria by the end of 2025 or Rachel and I will die trying. Um, on a less optimistic note, I actually think that, that uh, the RDT is actually going to be more problematic and we've actually had fairly senior Labor people say that to us. Um, and, and that's basically because we've got this imponderable of impairment versus presence and we don't have an answer to that. And the other one that's a real left field one is all the cowboys that are moving into prescription world. Um, who, I mean, it's great if you want to get access weed, but I mean, central to the arguments we've been running is it's uh, the primacy of the relationship between the patient and the doctor. And now we've got all these six minute tele telehealth sessions. And you know, they, they, that, that clearly is, that's eroding that credibility. So I'm a bit more pessimistic actually on the RDT, but I think, yeah, if one state breaks, the others will follow. So let's hope for that. Thanks very much. Uh, what, uh, somebody, um, uh, actually cornered me. Um, it, one of the good things about coming to Mardi Gras is people actually tell you what they think um, with it, without any uncertainty. And apart from those who say to me, why did you lock me up, you bastard? <laughs> Which is always sort of difficult to, to confront. Uh, one of the questions that I've been asked a few times today is, well, what do you say about Min's and others' argument that basically we have legalisation because you can now get medicinal cannabis? Basically, it's available to anyone who wants it, and so why do you keep carrying on with this crap? Jeremy? Uh, because it's not available to anyone who wants it, because it's incredibly expensive. I had my script filled this week, um, and it was 500 bucks. And, you know, I've got a good job, and it pays a wage, but 500 bucks is an enormous amount of money for medicine, um, and so if you're uh, less advantaged, less privileged, if you're um, a pensioner, then you can't access that and you should just be able to grow your medicine and your recreation. That's why our bill, our focus has been on making sure we focus on home grow first. So that's my argument. Yeah, sure, if people can afford it, but like, let's, you know, let's uh, operate from the bottom up and yeah, uh, support, support a homegrown model that allows people to grow and share. Um, can I just point out something on that? Um, it's an absolute bullshit thing to say because even if you can afford it, even if you can access it for your health, you have to surrender your freaking life because you can't get in a car and you can't drive safely and it's a compounding injustice. So Min's, in any answer to that suggestion, is just absurd. It really is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, David. Yeah, but the, the basic argument that people are using medicinal cannabis pathway to get recreational cannabis is true, right? Um, when you look at the numbers, there's been a surge of men in their 20s and 30s 
who are having anxiety and sleep disorders uh, getting it treated with recreational cannabis. Now, maybe there has been a surge of men in their 20s and 30s having anxiety and sleep disorder, or maybe that's the way you get access to cannabis in the medicinal. And I do think that undermines the kind of the essence of the medicinal cannabis concept. It's crazy expensive. It, it really discriminates against people in the regions if you've got to find a GP and go through that entire process. Um, and, and as Sue points out, you can't drive. So anyone who says that that model is effectively legalising cannabis, I, either A, hasn't tried it, or B, hasn't spoken to people, particularly in the regions. It's not. Yes, I would agree. And as Sue said, like it, it, and this is what the, the politicians we're dealing with are saying as well, that these driving laws are a human rights issue. They acknowledge that this is a major issue and it's a barrier. How can you be prescribed an opioid but be told, oh, just you know, take it easy as you're getting used to the medication and if you feel lethargic, don't drive? How can they have not the same, some sort of same similar structure for someone who's prescribed their medicine and has a relationship with a doctor and that's able to be explained? Um, on the, the um, being prescribed and, you know, is it a bit of a farce? Well, I think most people who consume cannabis would argue that we use it therapeutically. Yeah, maybe to help us get off to sleep, but that's also a therapeutic use. Mm. So um, to say that, you know, those that are accessing it are doing it to back, backdoor their way through the, the um, legalities is, I think, also something we need to have a bigger conversation about. Could I also point out that 70,000 people were arrested and charged for the possession of cannabis um, in the last 2020-21 um, criminal statistics. So to say that it's legal, but we're still arresting and charging 70,000 people, um, yeah, shows that that's absolutely not true at all. And as, as their primary offence, too. As their primary offence, exactly. And, you know, it's the 20% of all cases in the magistrate's court in Victoria are for the possession of drugs. Not the selling of drugs, not the dealing of drugs, but the possession or use of a drug. Yeah, and in New South Wales, 32,000 charges, 2022-23, for possession of drugs. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And as I pointed out today, that's 32,000 and 23,000 for breaching apprehended domestic violence orders. You know, like, go figure, where's your priorities in that? Shame, I reckon. The, I, was, I am and remain very excited about Australia becoming the first country in the world to enable psychedelics by prescription. And I do think it's important in the cannabis debate, and I want you, wanted your comments on that, because all of a sudden, holy shit, they're only pushing cannabis. Like, it's not these hard, heavy, really naughty psychedelic drugs. Um, do you think it's going to help what's happening in the psychedelic space? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, it's extraordinary, right? Here in Australia, the TGA, which is such a conservative organisation, uh, usually uh, was uh, basically surprised everybody with the uh, 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 rescheduling of psilocybin and MDMA, uh, MDMA, of course, for PTSD and psilocybin for uh, post uh, treatment resistance, sorry, depression. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, uh, and ketamine and, you know, so many other drugs, pretty much, well, a lot of illegal drugs are now being used for therapeutic purposes. Uh, absolutely, I think it is a um, huge... I just think psychologically now, like in terms of uh, the nation, conversations, you know, media reporting, like it's very hard to get sensationalist outrage uh, in any publication, even the conservative Murdoch uh, media, about drugs anymore. Like I wrote a story, I wrote an opinion piece uh, six months ago when there was all of these, um, uh, the drug deaths in southwest Sydney shootings and everything, um, that maybe we should think about legalising cocaine. And it was, uh, it was an opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald. I uh, got really positive media. Uh, Daily Telegraph didn't touch it. 2GB didn't touch it. I actually was went on Twitter going at Ben Fordham, 2GB, at Daily Telly, uh, 2G, uh, at Daily Telly, when a Greens MP publishes an opinion piece saying we should legalise cocaine and you don't touch it or mention it, uh, I think we're onto something. So, uh, yeah, I just think we're at, we're at the absolute precipice of... Uh, change. I think the public know it. They're there. And if the TGA is there, 
you know, in terms of it's irrefutable, the evidence is irrefutable, uh, I think, yeah, we will see change very soon. Um, the, the, sorry, Kate. The, per, the people that aren't there yet, though, are in New South Wales when it comes to MDMA um, and psilocybin is the, the chief psychiatrist. So we have been going to work in the New South Wales Parliament uh, having a series of meetings with health bureaucrats, the minister and the chief psychiatrist because the roadblock in, um, is no longer the federal legislation and the TGA, it's the fact that the, in, New, in New South Wales the government requires you to have your medicine, your therapy, your treatment um, in a hospital setting with an emergency department there and security and all the rest, which co completely undoes the efficacy of these treatments. And so we are arguing um, in New South Wales that they should bring in the Victorian model is that you can have it in a clinical setting. You know, and uh, we are really battling hard against that because since the laws changed in New South Wales, only one person has actually accessed these therapies. But uh, Rose Jackson is very cognizant of that. If people aren't accessing it, it's not working. There was a reason the TGA did this because of all these papers out of the, coming out of the United States saying of the positive impact. But the chief psychiatrist, Murray Watt, if you're listening in, you know, it's time to, you know, get out of the way. It's, yeah. Take a chill pill. <laughs> of, all the, of all the people up here, uh, all of us are politicians, uh, all of us are cannabis users, uh, but I'm probably the only one here who's actually a cannabis prescriber. And uh, so what I'm seeing on a daily basis when I'm actually in the clinic uh, is the complete failure of politics uh, and of governments to actually care even one little bit for the people it purports to represent. They do not. Uh, patients are left in a, uh, looking for mental help in a system which is completely failing. The very underlying principles of offering help to those who need it is not given. We are doing damage to our people by allowing them not to be treated. In fact, the APRA, uh, the medical board, uh, would prefer you don't treat rather than treat. Uh, so by doing harm, by not doing something, I've just been pinged by APRA for doing that and having to justify why, do, why have I treated someone that I've diagnosed correctly and have treated correctly, but because I'm not a psychiatrist, I shouldn't do that. That person must wait 18 months to get the diagnosis I know I've made correctly and get the treatment I know I've given correctly. Why? And the whole thing is a complete sham when they're saying that we're actually caring for the people. Are they fuck? Not a single one of them really cares. It's, it's, it's impossible. The, 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 the cannabis uh, treatment just now, um, trying to access that as a, a person who can't afford either the consult fee or the medication, and then you try and grow that for yourself. I had a patient, uh, she was sexually abused and has, has PTSD as a result of that, as a child. And her father was growing CBD-dominant uh, cannabis in his backyard to treat his own daughter because she, he couldn't afford that. They were both arrested because they were dobbed in by, by a neighbour. They were taken separately. The girl was put in the back of a cop car, taken to the station, and as bearing in mind she was actually sexually abused with PTSD, she was strip-searched. Now, the police did not break the law, but they certainly broke every law of morality that I know of, and they were completely justified according to the laws that we, actually as politicians, have written. Well, not us personally, but the politicians. So this is the situation we're facing. As this, uh, when we talk about legalizing cannabis by stealth, by prescribing, it still doesn't fit the bill because what, you're, you're still stigmatized. You can't drive because THC is in your system. Uh, and we know, absolutely know, that there's no correlation between the measure and impairment. In fact, we don't measure impairment at all. It's ridiculous. Yeah. David, I think what, that, what the TGA has done and what the growing body of international evidence is showing, how MDMA, psilocybin, cannabis can be incredibly important drugs for dealing with things like uh, treatment-resistant PTSD, um, entrenched treatment-resistant depression. It's creating whole new parts of the community that are suddenly thinking they've been lied to forever about this by politicians, and they're getting on board with the legalising campaign. And I, I'm the veteran spokes for the party federally. And I've got to tell you, you get a bunch of crusty old veterans in their, in their mid to late 60s who are saying, yeah, yeah, get on board with legalising cannabis. Um, get on board with getting this um, MDMA trial sorted. Get on board with the psilocybin. It's actually one of the things it's doing. It's massively expanding the number of people who are on board with the project. And I think that's actually really exciting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, th thanks so much. It's, it, you know, isn't it a sign of the times that here at Mardi Gras, we've got 
a tent with psychedelics, sessions about psychedelics through the whole morning uh, and afternoon. And uh, how marvellous is that, that we're spreading our wings into an area, uh, another area of health benefit. And cannabis has led the way, and I, I heard some fairly pessimistic stuff today about, oh, it's so expensive, it's taking so long, etc. Those of us who've been around long enough with medicinal cannabis know that at the start, it was expensive, it was impossible, it was only very few people. The main market was underground, but it's changing uh, with medicinal cannabis. One million cannabis patients prescribed now. Uh, hang on. <laughs> One million prescriptions. No. no, no, we've checked with the TGA. I'm on the Medicinal Cannabis Association. 300,000 patients. Well, we'll argue about that <laughs> later, but I can tell you that the Commonwealth Government website yeah. it's says wrong. a million patients. I know. It's wrong. Hmm. It, 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 uh, David, I, I, mm -hmm. I know it says it, and, and we, but we've, we've challenged them on it because it's, the industry will tell you it's wrong. The industry will tell you there's not a million patients, um, and the TGA will say, well, we didn't get a million patients, we got a million um, SAS at SAS, SASB applications, mm -hmm. um, but that does not mean that they, they were all for a separate patient. Well, the Commonwealth, oh, I'm sticking with the Commonwealth. Okay. It I mean, it's, a no, 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 it's a great number, it's a great number, and Good. the industry yeah. would love that to be the number. Mm. It would be a lot cheaper if there was that many patients. Mm. Mm. Well, Fiona and I were actually at the A Cannabis Conference, and the, um, the TGA people actually put up this PowerPoint, and it actually uh, at one point patients prescribed and and there was this gasp that went through the auditorium of you know, long last we know how many people and of course as soon as it came to questions it was like so you're saying there's 1.1 million people and and the the guy from the TGA went no I didn't say that and they said it's on your slide it's on your slide and he said and then went back to the slide and he said oh actually sorry that should be prescriptions okay. <laughs> so yeah that was a pretty definitive moment yeah yeah, yeah. Well, all of the that... advice from Pennington and etc saying that it's around 300,000 okay yeah I, I I just I, that was my understanding I just checked the the website and it's like 1.13 million um authorized prescriber um uh, um, instances, but it says the data does not reflect the number of patients accessing medicinal cannabis. A single patient may be prescribed multiple medicinal cannabis products under different APs. So Minus 5. I, I think, I think it's David. in debate. It's in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Of I clearly amazing. made the mistake of relying on the government. On the government. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, my, my can, mistake. Can mistake. I make a Wait, point, wasn't David? that defence yeah. used in your court for yeah. people relying on the government website about when cannabis would be out of their system? Goodness me. Well, the Supreme Court's done that in. Absolutely. Yeah. A point I'd like to make there is that um, what we do know, I recently went down to Tasmanian Botanics, which is one of Australia's largest uh, medicinal cannabis producers, and, what, and I've tried to get around and visit like a lot of industry players in the medicinal cannabis space, and what you overwhelmingly hear from them is crickets, silence. They are not lobbying the politicians for change on RDT. They're not po lobbying the politicians for change on at to adult use. They just want to keep making a fuck ton of money. And that's what they're doing. The Australian medicinal cannabis industry is the most profitable in the world. The market is the fastest growing in the world. And even at 300,000, we're the largest per capita uh, medicinal cannabis market in the world. So the medicinal cannabis industry has had a lot of big corporate players come in, the big end of town, and they don't want anything to change while they're making, like they're growing cannabis for less than a dollar a gram. That's their you know, cost. Um, and they're selling it for 15 bucks, 17 dollars, and some of it's just imported shit from South Africa. Yeah, that's right. And let's remember that most of the medicinal cannabis that's provided in Australia is imported. The the the, the locally made product is still just a very small minority of the the medicine that's um. And that's I think I think sold. David, I think uh, David can shame. probably be outraged. I think David can probably tell us a bit about the industry response to his bill. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of inter interesting. The National Medicinal uh, Cannabis Association put in first a very uh, kind of aggressive response to, to legalising cannabis, um, talking about all of our important international agreements and how that means we shouldn't have uh, recreational cannabis. 
And, and I, I phoned them up and said, are you serious? Like, you know, those international agreements would actually trim the wings of, of your industry anyhow. Do you really want to be seen as standing out against um, recreational cannabis reform? And they kind of got the wobbles and then uh, retreated back into the, uh, you know, into a, a nice sort of dark hydroponics with the hydroponics lab with the lights off. But, the, um, but it was fascinating actually to watch that. But there, there have been a number of players though, smaller players in the industry who are on board. And I think some of them see their experience in the medicinal cannabis industry as a great way of sort of stepping into recreational, a much bigger uh, recreational uh, market. So it's, it's, not, it's not monolithic. And, and, and one of the reasons why in Tasmania they're not worried about the drug driving laws is Tasmania doesn't have a problem with its drug driving laws. It's the one part of the country where they don't have the presence offence. And there is no difference in, our, in, the, in, the, in the data on drug-related, drug-connected um, trauma at all in Tasmania. We just need to do what Tasmania does. But let, let's, as politicians, also look at a fact here. Uh, we have uh, the international laws regarding cannabis, which are being changed, of course, which is now affecting the national and the state laws. But those international laws have defined cannabis as a narcotic. Now, that's an absolute stinking lie. So what we have then is a, a whole series of laws at all the different tiers of government based on a lie. So every single law restricting cannabis is wrong. And this must have a, a, a pushback. We must get this sorted by the, the political world. Stop, for the love of all that is holy, stop propagating a lie. And let's finally grow cannabis as a healthy healing herb like anything else and just treating it as such because it's by far the safest herb we've got there. Better than cannabis, better than, than alcohol, better than tobacco. This will keep you safe. Just stop propagating a lie. And it's not that difficult uh, concept to achieve. Why do politicians still want to maintain a lie? I don't know. Okay. I actually think there's room for both. There's room for people to grow their own at home, which is, you know, think of like buying chickens at a supermarket. You can buy caged eggs, you can buy organic chicken eggs, or you can actually just have chickens at home and grow your own. There is the same comparison could be made about cannabis. You know, if you're wanting a high-end product where you know the levels of THC, CBD, and you're wanting certain terpenes in that, you know if you buy something medicinally that that's will be, that will be prescribed to you. If you're just wanting to grow something in your backyard that you like to have a joint of every night, well, that's also another option that should be available to you. So I think the medicinal industry to say, you know, we don't, we don't support recreational use, it's the exact same product, and they would be selling it in dispensaries if they had the option to, so they can... And lots do support. Yeah. So the other question that I was asked is, what's the point of having the balance of power? And I know not all of you do, but what is the point of having the balance of power if you're not going to, at some stage or other, draw a line in the sand and say, we are not going to vote for anything you want unless you give us these things, RDT, decrim legalisation and koalas? When, when is the point? When do you say that? Or do you say that? Is this worth dying in a ditch? I'm glad you said koalas because uh, we, <laughs> we, uh, there's a number of issues that if we were going to, uh, you know, basically pull up the drawbridge and really say, like, no, no more, uh, there's a number of issues. Um, we need to also do it, I think, when, if we are going to, we need to kind of have the public with us as well. We can't just wake up one morning and, you know, the Greens have a party room meeting and say, yes, let's do it tomorrow and, you know, waltz on out and say we're going to do that. We have to have momentum and there has to be uh, a reason uh, behind it. I think Hopefully in New South Wales, the drug summit will happen. We're hearing in October. I hate kind of talking about the drug summit as though it's this amazing thing, right? It's a bloody excuse from the Labor government to push off action for a couple of years. I don't support the whole concept really, uh, but that's what they're saying uh, has to happen. I don't think we can do anything before then, as I've said, um, but... I do, we do need to, to, to do it. We do need to exercise our balance of power. We haven't really done it yet uh, on anything major. 
you know, we kind of have amended, obviously, we amend bills, we do everything all the time, we are actually extremely powerful in that upper house and the government knows it, so they're not bringing bills uh, before the parliament as a result. It's absolutely extraordinary. We are in the most progressive New South Wales government in terms of the balance and the makeup. Greens, legalised cannabis, animal justice party in the upper house. They can't do anything without the four greens, basically, in terms of something, you know, good. So what are they doing? They're not bringing the good laws. Yeah. They're actually not bringing the good laws. Uh, so that's what we need to make them do. They have to do something after the drug summit. The build up, they can't do that and not act. And that's when we do that, whether it's probably towards the end of the year, we need to work cross party, we need to work very closely. Um, but it's so important that there's a moment and we take advantage of that because that's what's gonna press, press them and pressure them. And so we're cognizant of it. Um, so watch this space. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it is, I just want to say about balance of power as well. It's not just this thing that's tangibly right there at any given moment that you just do. It it's quite a nuanced thing. It requires particular circumstances. And obviously one of them is what Kate's saying very clearly about having the public bringing people along. Um, but it also is about literally what is the things before the gov that the government is bringing that you can then leverage. <laughs> like it's very, it's quite nuanced. And honestly, I cannot, I cannot reinforce enough what Kate has just said. The current New South Wales Labor government is so Labor shit light, it's quite frightening. It is honestly frightening. Like, they are standing there right now, and I'm just going to digress, saying, we will not let koalas go extinct on our watch. They are literally every day logging the crap out of koala habitat, and they could stop it today, yesterday. And this is how lacking in courage and spine and vision and agenda they really are. But we are ready for the moment for the things that we are lining up. Cannabis is one, ending native forest logging is another. And those circumstances, we are lining those up. Yeah. Dave, David, um, yeah, I just, uh, I guess I'd say, coming from Victoria, Australia's most progressive state, um, we, uh, we, uh, we, we saw that demonstrated uh, very clearly on 420 when 40 of our people were dragged away and we had 50 or 60 police officers with sniffer dogs working their way through the crowd. Um, and I have to say, Rach and I and, and uh, the, the party members generally have since then had a bit of a tanty um, and said we're not in love anymore. I mean, we worked very closely with the government for the first 12 months. Uh, we've now got um, a constitutional amendment where they're two, short, two votes short and we've told them they can, oh, if I can use a biblical quote, go forth and multiply. Um, and, uh, and we've got a couple of other bills where we put to the sword. And uh, yeah, I think we are at that. It, it needs to be said, and what, what Sue says, right, is, is you know, like balance of power sounds really like, oh, you know, nuclear, push the red button. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Like in, in Victoria, we're constitutionally precluded from uh, amending budget bills. Because everyone says, oh, why don't you just cut off the money? Well, well legally, we can't. Um, and of course, the other one is if you just think about how these upper houses work, you know, Two thirds of the bills never go to the vote. It's because the, the Labor Party and the opposition vote together. So we only have that small window. And then in terms of what you're blocking, the things you would be potentially blocking in that scenario are often very progressive pieces of legislation. So what are you gonna do? You say, well, actually, no, we're gonna vote against bail reform. You know, we're gonna vote against restrictions on you know, attempts to try and crack down on domestic violence. You know, we're going to try and, you know, we're, we're going to block First Nations treaty negotiations. There's all these things that yeah. you go, well, actually, you know, we're not going to fucking block them. Yeah. You know, because our own members would be disgusted at us for doing it. So I guess it's, just, it's a really hard one. The frustration is such that there's times where you just want to throttle them. They're that gutless. You just want to throttle them. But the reality is it's just 
not that practical. There will be brief moments where we can apply pressure and we try and seize every one of those moments. But in terms of just a general blockade, nah, not going to happen. I think if I can just add, I had held a balance, a balance of power um, in the Victorian uh, in the Victorian Parliament for eight, for eight years, and it is, as everyone has said, it's far more nuanced than that. It 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 isn't just yeah doing the red button because quite often this then means that the government has to rely on conservative votes to get through legislation. And as we're seeing in New South Wales, they're not putting through progressive legislation because they um, they're not willing to to have to. Um, see the Greens and legalised cannabis supporting them and being seen to pass that legislation. However, in that nuance, you know, in in the eight years I was there, we were able we were able to get things through that um, that didn't look possible, like a supervised injecting room or assisted dying or even sex work reform or you know a whole range of issues. Um, but it, it it it's not just what happens on the floor. It's it's all of the work that you have to do behind and and it. It's, um, and it's the relationships that you form with government. Now, I know, you know, I mean, I think for animal justice in Victoria, they, you know, when the, the government announced that they would not support a ban on duck hunting, you know, if Georgie Purcell had walked out of that chamber and just said, well, forget it, I'm never voting for you again, I would, you would be completely a right to, un, to appreciate her position. However, she knows that she wants to get progressive legislation through, and so in many ways you have to work with the government of the day to get all the progressive legislation through. So it, it is a lot more nuanced, but it is a powerful position, and I think everyone up here has been using it to the best of their ability. David, then... Yeah, I mean, the, um, it, it really works when the government wants something and they need you. I mean, that's when balance power is really powerful. So, for example, uh, we're in a national housing crisis, someone may have noticed in the room, and the government was putting through some really shit national housing laws, and we just applied the blowtorch, and it worked because millions and millions of Australians were behind us, and we ended up getting an extra like, $3 billion in public housing out of them. But at some point, you know, you get it to a point of where you've caused maximum pain, you've had a national campaign, you get a few bit, you know, in that case, I think $3 billion is really meaningful. Um, and, um, and then you, that's how you exercise your balance of power. We did the same on climate. But, but um, you know, literally, someone said two thirds of the time, 80% of the time, the Labor Party and the Coalition agree on yeah. most of the stuff they're doing. And, and, and the, the more shit the law is, the more likely they are to agree on it. Yeah. And, and so I think the bigger challenge is actually to absolutely smash that two-party stranglehold on politics, you know, and that is happening, that is absolutely happening. And, and, and once we, we break that in the lower houses and they can't rely on just a blank uh, part, one-party majority in those lower houses, and it could happen as early as the next federal election federally, as we see more Teals, more Greens elected uh, across the country, that creates a whole new dynamic about whether or not they can stay in government, yeah. whether or not they can get their budget bill even through the first stage. And I think having the balance of power in both houses, and I'm, I really, you know, I really think that's a genuine prospect after the next federal election, that is actually going to change the dynamic quite, quite noticeably. Thanks. Jeremy? Yeah, your natural inclination as a politician is to vote for good laws and vote against bad laws. But if you're going to play hardball with the government, well, you're going to vote for good laws. But, you know, the, if you want to exercise that, you, mo you have to potentially vote for a, l a law that you wouldn't, you know, necessarily support. That's one of the, the, that's what we sort of call horse trading in the issue. So finding that time uh, is, is difficult. It's, um, uh, and it is a very nuanced uh, uh, thing to have to do. But one of the things you can do, um, it's not about legislation, it's about the procedural matters, the, the mechanics of parliaments. The, the government has an agenda and they're usually pretty keen to get it up. And they're in a hurry. You have ministers, they've been working on a bill for a year, they've done all this consultation, they want it up. Um, and a lot of the time you'll see an opposition doing what oppositions do, delaying reform, throwing some sand in the gears and those types of things. So that's where you can say to the government, look, you know, I'm not going to support the opposition's opposition, you know, referring this to an inquiry, doing this, you know, um, uh, these types of things, if 
you're going to support me on, in another area. So that's where you can exercise it, where it doesn't manifest itself in terms of bad laws, but it's, a, it's about using the procedures of the parliament to get an outcome. One of the things that uh, I've discovered in politics is that it's, it's not as simple. You've got a, a place in Parliament and of course now we can pass the laws. That's nonsense. Uh, one of the most important things any politician can learn is that the main function of a polit politician, I would believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is to build relationships. You want to actually work with people uh, to get your point across and to get support for what you believe in and to get allies and to find ways of working. We call this behind the chair. Uh, so uh, the secret stuff that happens and in the bar over a cup of coffee or indeed a beer. Um, the, the committee work that we do is, is, is often bipartisan or tripartisan uh, and we, we, we work to the common good as far as we can in those closed chambers that you don't really often see. But in Parliament, uh, this backwards and forwards is entirely unprofitable, unproductive and that's where, where you see what we are doing. Actually what we're doing is working very quietly behind the scenes to find people who can actually do the right thing. I, can I Thanks. just say, I also think at one of our roles as the crossbench and the ones literally, as David said, doing the most important work we can do for politics now and tomorrow and the next day to get the stranglehold of the two-party system relegated to the past of complete dysfunction and brutal offence on democracy is we need to disrupt and we need to disrupt wherever we can and we do need to actually put forward the vision of what it is we're all working for. Because when we just sit in there and we just go along and we accept the status quo, we are failing in our role as the crossbench. Our job in the parliament is to walk towards a better democracy. It's not to get too stuck in the mechanics and the procedures of this system that is failing the planet, it's failing the people, and it's failing the future. Okay, thank you. The, we, there is one, one minute. There is one thing really I want to say about that because you're absolutely right. We have an enemy in politics. We have one major enemy and that is the status quo. That idea which keeps us stuck in the past. A whole range of civil servants, their entire job is to keep us stuck in the past. They advise the ministers. That's what's stopping the progress. That's stopping innovation and that is our enemy. We need new thinking. We need it now because the old thinking simply doesn't work. Thank you. Can I... Can I say that uh, in thanking the politicians, we, we're going to wrap up, but in thanking them, I also want to remind them, myself and all of us, that there's people here in the audience for whom this is not politics. Yes, this is deadly personal. That's They're people who've been or are going to jail. They're people who can't get the medicines for their really sick children and family members because they either can't afford it or they can't afford not to drive. There are people here who are struggling every day because of our stupid drug laws. And, while, and I think that, uh, that we all need to keep that in mind, that this is not some abstract fight. This is actually about, this is a really important fight that strikes at the heart of our rights as individuals, our ability to heal ourselves, and our ability to change the world and make it a better place. And I would really, you know, politicians don't have to come here, share their views. And can I say that obviously the most important thing we can do is vote. Yeah. The second most important thing we can vote do green. is go and see your local members and tell them about what's happening in your life, about your drug issues, because that way then maybe that will, will help disrupt. Can I thank all of you for coming uh, and, and participating in this in such a friendly and cooperative way. <laughs> and, um, I, and you know, this, this is what unity for a cause looks like. So thank you very much.